These videos are offered on a pay-what-you-like basis. You can pay for the use of the videos at my website. There's a link to my website in the info box. The address is www.freelance-teacher.com slash videos dot htm. Or you can just use the link in the info box. Thank you. Uh, let's think about, say, a hydrogen atom or a hydrogen molecule. Well, what's the formula for a hydrogen molecule? H2. Good, not H. So it might seem like an obvious question, but hydrogen is diatomic. So a hydrogen molecule has the formula H2. Or H, H. And now we're going to try to use molecular orbital theory to describe this molecule. Molecular orbital theory as a way of describing this molecule. And this is, in a way, I guess, kind of an alternative to um, the VSEPR, or the hybridization theory. Although sometimes, confusingly, you can kind of combine those things, like she was doing on the yellow sheet. But in a way, this is just kind of an alternative theory. So the fact is, there's no real perfect way to describe in words and pictures the way a molecule is. Instead, there's just different approximations that are useful in different situations. And you guys have learned about the hybridization approximation, and now, um, we're going to go into a different approximation that works better in some cases, which is the molecular orbital theory approximation. Uh, although we're going to use a lot of the same concepts that we used before for hybridization. Well, let, let's see, what are, the, what, what are the, the valence orbitals that we have here? Well, wh what energy level is hydrogen uh, using in its, for its electrons? One, two, three, or four? One. Yeah, it's at the very start of the periodic table, so it's using the n equals one energy level. And what type of orbital? does hydrogen have? What, what type of orbital is there in, a, in, in the first energy level? S. Just S. The first energy level only has S. So we could uh, have a hydrogen here, and we could say that this hydrogen has a 1S orbital. And then I can put a hydrogen over here and say that it also has a 1S orbital. And oftentimes we label an orbital just with a dash. So we could label, uh, indicate these two orbitals with dashes. How many electrons would, how many electrons is this hydrogen contributing to the molecule? One. Yeah, it started with one, so it's contributing one electron, so we can indicate that like this. And we can say that this hydrogen is also contributing one electron. Now, this is what I would call an atomic orbital. This hydrogen has a 1s atomic orbital as in virtue of being an atom, and this has a 1s atomic orbital. In order to form the molecule, um, the molecule is formed because we're going to combine the atomic orbitals to form molecular orbitals. So in this theory, we're combining the individual atomic orbitals to form molecular orbitals. How do we combine them? Well, we kind of blend them together, or we have them overlap in a way. Now, how many molecular orbitals can we get by overlapping these two orbitals? Well, the principle that we always use is conservation of orbitals. However many orbitals you're blending together, that's how many blended orbitals you get out. So however many atomic orbitals we're mixing, that's how many molecular orbitals we're going to get out. So if we're mixing together this atomic orbital and this atomic orbital, how many molecular orbitals is that going to make? Two. Two, yeah, two orbitals. All right, and generally what we're going to have is one of the orbitals that we form will be lower in energy than the atomic orbitals, and one will be higher in energy than the atomic orbitals. And we can indicate that with a picture that looks like this. So we're going to have high energy being high on the blackboard and low energy being low on the blackboard. So notice how this dash is lower than this line, and this dash is higher, and this, I think, should be uh, symmetric. So whatever this distance is should be the same as this distance. So these are symmetrically distributed around this middle line. Now, what are we going to call it when these two orbitals overlap? Well, we can use the terms sigma and pi to refer to molecular orbitals. We can use sigma and pi to refer to molecular orbitals. In, in the previous theories that you learned about with the valence bond theories, you learned about the sigma and pi bonds. Mm -hmm. Well, now we're going to see a similar idea, similar but a little bit different, where we're talking about sigma and pi molecular orbitals. Uh, well, if you, have, if you have the overlap of two 1s orbitals, do you know is that going to give us a sigma or a pi overlap? 
or in general, would we expect this to be a sigma or a pi bond? Sigma. Sigma. So it turns out that we would also be, in the molecular orbital theory, we would be considering these sigma molecular orbitals. I could call this a one sigma molecular orbital. And then this would be called one sigma star. Star is used for the high energy, the, high, the, the energies that are, uh, the molecular orbitals that are higher than you started. Another term that your instructor might have used is bonding and anti-bonding orbitals. So this lower energy orbital is called the bonding orbital, and then we use a star for the anti-bonding orbitals. Oh, um, it'll help if I keep looking at your lecture notes to make sure I'm giving the same way. Yeah, so she's, this is the terminology she's using. Good. Uh, and in fact, she goes beyond that, and she would call this one sigma one s, just to indicate that this was made out of the overlap of two one s atomic orbitals. And this would be called one sigma star, one s. So let's not confuse the ideas of atomic and molecular orbitals. We're using uh, this symbol for this atomic orbital and this atomic orbital, and then we're using sigma and pi and sigma and pi star to stand for the molecular orbitals that come from the overlap. All right, and now we have to take these electrons and apportion them here, and we can use the Aufbau principle, which is that we want to put these as low as possible. Um, so what's the lowest possible place that we can put this? We want to put it at the, low, at, the, at the bottom dash. These would be the lowest possible places that we could put these. Right? We wouldn't want to put either of these up here until we have to. In fact, do we have to put any electrons up here? No, because we're able to put both of our electrons down here. Uh, and are you familiar with the idea that we, they, they should have opposite spins? Mm -hmm. So uh, how, here's how we would put these. OK, and now we can see why hydrogen is a stable molecule. Why, why the hydrogen prefers being a molecule rather than separate atoms, because both of these electrons have moved to lower energy. Do things want high or low energy? energy? Everything wants to lower its energy. So now we can see this model seems to be working. It's explaining why the hydrogen atoms prefer to combine to form a molecule. Because when they're separate atoms, the electrons have to be in these relatively high energy atomic orbitals. <clears throat> but by combining the atomic orbitals, they're, they're enabled to get to a lower energy. Uh, and that would uh, put them down here. But by the way, how is this happening? Well, remember that one way to describe an orbital is in terms of waves. We can kind of think of an orbital in terms of a wave function. And then when we're combining these two, it's like the two waves are interfering with each other. Uh, I don't know, have you guys taken any physics? Um, yes? All right. Well, when two waves interfere, they can in interfere either constructively or destructively. There's two ways that waves can interfere, constructively or destructively. Well, this bonding orbital occurs when these two wave functions interfere constructively, and that turns out to lower our energy. Whereas the anti-bonding occurs when the two waves uh, interfere destructively, and that turns out to give us an anti-bonding wave. We don't need to get too much into the detail of it because those details are kind of more advanced than you would get into too much in an introductory course. But it's good to know that the fact that there's a bonding and anti-bonding orbital here comes from the fact that this really represents a wave function, and this represents a wave function, and we're just basically averaging these or adding these two wave functions together. And we can do it when the wave functions are either in phase or out of phase. Well, when the wave functions are in phase, they interfere constructively. And that turns out to be the bonding low energy point. And when they uh, are out of phase, they interfere destructively. And that would give us this. Um, now, let's use the idea of bond order. So the, uh, the formula for the bond order is number of electrons in bonding molecular orbitals minus the number of electrons And anti-bonding. So I'm using MO here as our abbreviation for molecular orbitals. Times one half. This is just a formula to memorize. This is how we calculate the bond order. Number of electrons in bonding molecular orbitals minus the number of electrons in anti-bonding molecular orbitals times one half. Well, let's apply that to this case. Uh, what, what would this number be for this example? And this number would be, so what does that give us as a bond order? 
they would say the bond order is one. And notice that if we just used our normal Lewis structure theory, that would also say that there's one bond between these two hydrogens. So the bond order is approximately corresponds to how many bonds we would be drawing in a Lewis diagram. So once again, the theory seems to be working because it's predicting the correct number of bonds between these two atoms. So the bond order corresponds to what we would just think of as the bonds in the Lewis structure, or in the VSEPR theory. Okay, so I think we've pretty much explained the hydrogen molecule, and we can see why hydrogen prefers to be diatomic rather than monatomic. Uh, now, of course, the hydrogen here has many other orbitals. It also has 2s orbitals and 2p orbitals and 3s and 3p and 3d, uh, but those are all empty. And they would be empty still in the molecular orbital as well, so there's no point drawing them. So we're only going to draw the orbitals that have a chance of being filled in the molecule. So these are the only orbitals that are worth drawing. 